This meeting is being recorded. There we go. Okay. Uh, right, so go. You, if you guys go to Neil's picture at the at the top, if you click on participants, find the picture of Neil's vo uh, vice, the camera on the vice, and pin it. That will stay center screen. Mm. Ah. Neil. Ah. Now I'm on a laptop, so um, all the pictures are on the top of the thing for me. But uh, Adam was saying, if you go down to the icons at the bottom where it says participants, click on that. <laughs> I don't know what Mal Malcolm's doing. Nobody. Let me, there we go. <laughs> okay, Neil. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, good evening, everyone. Um. Please be gentle. I'm I'm really quite nervous about this. No, I'm um, so, nervous. Yeah, well, uh, you seem like a decent enough bunch anyway. So uh, I'm going to try and do um, a couple of river patterns and maybe one pattern that you could use for the river and also more, more really more for the still water aspects. But we'll see how we go. Um, so we're going to start simple um, just to get me warmed up, really. Um, so I'm going to tie a little um, sort of grub maggot that I use quite often during the winter uh, when I'm fishing for grayling, um, especially if you're on a beat where the sort of the, the bait is allowed. Um, it can be quite good, this little pattern, if you can uh, get somebody to trot through the, the actual beat with maggots first. Um, so what I've got in the hook, a, uh, in the vice, is a uh, sort of just a, a grub hook, really. This one is the Airx 525, which is a, a sort of a utility, can be used as a dry fly hook as well, so it's quite fine wire. Um, so first thing, hopefully not getting my hands in the way. What size right. uh, That's a size 10. It, typically, I'll tie it on a 12, but I just thought if it's tied on a 10 tonight, you might be able to see it better. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just underbody um, is a little bit of lead wire. And I'm going to just try and take that around the bend a little bit. May I switch uh, the camera, please? Yeah. Sorry? Um, I have your two videos on. I have only your side view, your nice face. Oh, you're on the wrong. Yeah, I'm on twice. Okay, so I picked the wrong one. Yeah, so if you, I think mine will come up as my iPhone. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Alois, hmm. if, you, if you pin, if you pin the iPhone, uh, they they both say Neil Darling, but you you'll find that the one uh, on the i iPhone. Has got a picture of the device. So pin that and that will stay centre screen. Yeah. Sorry, Neil. Yep, yeah, okay, okay, no problem. So that's about, I don't know, 10, 12 wraps of the lead and then just a little dab of super glue to finish it off. Um, next is going to be the fluorescent underbody. Um, so I'll just go straight in with the uh, pink fluorescent floss. There we go, slippy stuff. So sometimes it can be a little bit awkward to start off. Um, is it glow bright? That's glow bright, that's right, yeah. Um, I've covered up the number of it actually, but yeah, it's it's the glow bright pink. Neil, could you turn the turn the sound off on your iPad? Yeah, it is off, Derek. Because there's like a, a double. <clears throat> I wonder if it's because I've got them both pins. You can't. I've only. <laughs> I've only got signed on on the iPhone, Derek. Yeah. Let me unpin pin your other picture. Uh, <clears throat> Is that any better, Derek? Has that worked? Mm. Yeah, that's better. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, so all we're going to do is build up 
a little bit of a tapered sort of body for the actual fly. And I'm going to use the floss as well to tie in a few other materials. <clears throat> so all I'm tying in, I'm not sure this is going to show up. It's a really, really light nylon. Um, it's not necessary because the, the fly will be actually um, covered in resin. It's not to protect the fly or anything. I just find when I'm, I use the nymph skin, uh, this stuff, um, it just gives better segments. Uh, as before you put the resin on, it keeps those segments. So again, just tying that in and securing all the way to the bend. And then at the same time, building up a bit of that body profile if I can. Um, just clip that off. Next coming in is the uh, nymph skin. So all I've done, let's see if I can get this in shot. A uh, little point on it so that I can trap it down and secure the corner. And once I've got two wraps over it, just start to pull so that you don't get a big bulky build up. And just again, pull that all the way down to where you want the fly to finish. And we'll build this back up. There we go. And we should be at the point where we can tie off the actual floss now and go to thread. I might have to do this. There we go. There we go. I'll tell you what, you're a very good audience, very good class. I've never had a class at school. Stay so quiet for so long. They're all on mute. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that with the kids, unfortunately. <laughs> so next thing uh, is my tie-in thread. Um, which just grabbing some white tie in thread. You can see through. Your hang on, folk. I do have time for idea of somewhere. Oh, schoolboy error. Got everything else set up and I can't find my time thread. Oh, I hear this. Sorry, guys. All right. Right. Yeah, we're all good. I'll just uh, hid my time thread, Derek. Right, so a little bit of white fine thread on, just at the head of the hook. What's that one? There we go. Okay. And I'm just going to secure that. Oh, it's awkward tying over this camera. I'm just going to secure that with a couple of whip finishes there. Okay. So, nymph skin, fantastic. Because um, if it goes wrong, you can sort of reset it on the, the actual hook again. Um, what I tend to try and do, I'm just trying to get rid of that. What I tend to try and do is when I wrap up, can you see the cut point there? That's sort of the edge where I've, I've angled the cut in. I try and make sure that that always leads up towards the eye of the hook because you'll actually cover that cut as you go up through the body. So just before I go up, I want to just add a little bit of depth and detail to the pattern. So I'm just going to mark off underneath with a Sharpie. It's just a black Sharpie the sort of aspects that you might see, just the different colorings you'd see on a maggot, I guess. Um, it doesn't have to be too accurate at all. Nice and tight with the nymph skin on the first turn. Lots of tension, get it to grip and bite. 
And what I'm trying to do as I go up is loosen off the tension ever so gradually and at the same time cover half of the wrap that's gone before. So you start to get that sort of layered effect on the body. And that stray hair is doing my head and hang on. Get rid of that. Yep. I'm just trying to cover up halfway and start to relax the tension on the actual nymph skin itself. And you can see that that sort of, hopefully the maggoty profile is starting to build up. Fluorescent floss is really good. It comes through this uh, natural nymph skin really, really well. And as I get to the front again, I'm just putting a little bit more tension in just to neaten everything off. Okay, so a little bit awkward this, but here we go. So as I get to the front, it is a bit awkward with the way I've set the camera up. Sorry, guys. And I'm just going to put three securing wraps in at the front. There we go. There's two. And there's the third one there. Three. Good stuff. And then what I tend to do with the virtual nymph skin, because it's pretty slippy, I'll put one or two underneath and then go again on top just to make sure, because it, it can have a mind of its own, really. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and there we go, nip it off under tension. You should get quite a clean finish. Um, just make sure I'm tidying up at the front. Again, a little bit of it whip finish just to come in there or a half inch there we go. so back to the other end of the hook and all I'm going to try and do with this nylon is follow the segmentation on the actual nymph skin and dig into the nymph skin a little bit as I go Just like so. And you can see that that starts to <clears throat> bring through the felt tip from underneath a little bit. The, the virtual nymph skin is fantastic stuff. Just dig it in. All the way through. There we go. And again, just try and... Sorry, guys, about the camera shake. There we go. I'm going to have to move the camera for the next one. I'll have a go. There we go. I'm happy with that. Um, and again, just cut that off. And that is more or less the fly done, apart from its resin coat. So I'll just tidy up a little bit. It's a little bit lumpy there. There. like to see you using your fingers for the whip finish. I'm usually a little bit more dexterous, Derek. This camera in front of me is uh, very awkward. I might just have to give myself a bit more room for... Ah, there we go. That's better. There we go. That'll do nicely. Yeah, Grandad taught me the whip finish with uh, the old fingers. Right then, so the final bit is just a little bit of um, resin, um, Thin Man Classic that I've got here. Um, what I tend to do with the resins, because again, a little bit too much of a squeeze and they can absolutely shoot out of the packet or the bo bottle. Um, look, I, my niece is a, a beautician and she uses these things in her line of work. Um, I have no idea what they're even called, but they're like a, a, a varnish applicator. Um, so what I tend to do is just put a dab onto the applicator. And that way I've got control of it. 
Um, start at the thickest part of the fly and just paint it round until I'm happy with the covering. And again, hopefully what you should see is that the nymph skin again goes really quite translucent, hopefully. Um, and you'd be surprised how much area you, you can cover with a, a pretty small dab of the resin. But it just gives that sort of finished maggoty sort of look. And there we go. Just hit it with the torch. And again, you can see how the sort of the, the underbody glows through as well. So in a little bit of a colored water that might actually pick itself up, no problem to the to the fish. So there you go. Yep, I'm not that's not a bad one for a, a first start. Not a bad one at all. So hopefully that came across all right. Apologies for the camera shakes. There you go, that's the first one. How you doing? Um, so yeah, I'd probably uh, fish that as a, sometimes fish it as a point fly with a, a heavier uh, grayling bug above it um, and, and use it on the Euronymph in style that way. Um, there is weight, obviously, the lead under body to it, but uh, not enough for the sort of the winter conditions. So as part of a Euronymph in outfit, that's, that's quite a nice little sort of point fly sometimes with two really heavy droppers above it. Uh, just to keep it off, uh, you know, a, a lighter fly on the point will keep it off the snagging from the bottom, hopefully, as well. All right, then. Any questions before uh, we're all happy? Are we all still there? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all there, but they're on mute. So if you guys want to ask Neil a question, if you unmute yourself and then uh, re ask, ask the question, then then mute yourself again. I think they're all happy, Neil. Brilliant. They're all happy or they're all asleep. <laughs> Brilliant. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Right then. Let's go for the second pattern. So just let me tidy off a little bit. There we go. Okay. So... We'll go to the opposite end and we'll do um, a little bit of a dry fly, utility sort of dry fly pattern. So, okay, how's, how's that looking, Derek? Still okay? Still yeah, quite clear? Fine. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay. So this hook is a size 12 and it's a, a, a curved dry fly from um, Eric's hooks. So there's a, an average, so slightly just a, a little bend um, in this, which is perfect, absolutely perfect for the style of fly that I'm going to do. So if I show you, hopefully will that show up. So the the fly that I'm showing you at the minute is um called a Leatherman. It's uh tied and designed by um a guy called Tommy Solberg. He, I, he's Danish, I think. Um and he, he uses this uh as a utility sort of dry fly. Um so you know he, he quite often will use it to represent water boatmen or when there's a beetle fall, that sort of thing. Um, I've never fished it before. Um, the, the actual pattern itself just grabbed my attention, really, just because it does look like a great wee fly. Uh, but I'm, I'd be quite interested to see if it actually works in the, the Welsh season with the, uh, the Cockabondu beetle. Mm -hmm. And when they start to fall, we'll see. We'll see. So with that in mind, um, you know, that's that's why I, I actually tied, tied this up. So... Uh, what am I using here? This is just uh, UTC um, 8 -0. And uh, you can see I've actually now managed to find my white thread. So just secure the thread to start with. I tend to go about three quarters of the way down. Um, so the first thing that we're going to put in here are the CDC feathers. Um, 
And for size 12, for this pattern, um, Tommy sort of recommends using two CDC feathers, quite large ones. Um, so, you know, th those are, are decent sized CDCs. And all I'm trying to do is match the tips up as best I can. And you can always test how the actual end of the fly, the, the sort of the, the flu aspect of it, if you like, just pinch it together and you can sort of see how that fly is going to actually finish off or the feathers are going to blend for you. Um, if you're not happy, just reset them again. So one thing that we need to try and do, and it, again, it's personal preference. The, the front part here, you don't want to have that aspect of the fly too long or too short. And it's trying to gauge how much of the feather you need for the back of the actual fly to then leave you enough to secure at the front. Um, so it does take a little bit of getting used to and, and um, measurement, but one way that I've found to try and set the CDC is Pinch, pinch the actual end of the CDC feathers and sort of attach them with my th thumb and finger as if that is the front of the fly. I can then grab the feathers and then I pinch again on the part of the CDC feather that is closest to the eye. And that should give me enough to then bring the actual holes, you know, the, the actual fibers forward and still leave enough to finish off the fly. Um, it's not an exact science, but uh, it seems to, to work okay. So pinch and loop, secure the, the CDC in. And again, if you want, trim off some of the excess, but don't trim right close to the stems. Trim off just short of the actual eye of the hook because you can use the feathers to build up your 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 body profile a little bit as well. And I, I tend to cut them at an angle. And we'll just, we'll tidy that up with thread in a minute. At this point, before we go any further, I will sort of just see, and that again, as you can see, that that's more or less where I'd want it to be. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that. So just tidy up. We'll go forwards and secure those down. And you can see that I've, started to build a little bit of a, a lump bump body profile there for the next step. So tidy that up and stop about halfway. So what I'm now going to add is a peacock curl. And it's, you know, this is, as you can see, very close to the eye. I tend to go for that because the fibers are slightly longer. Um, you know, and this one, this one's uh, a good, good, decent uh, color as well. There's a, a a good green sheen off this one. Um, so again, tip of the peacock is very brittle, very delicate. So try and avoid tying with tying in with that if you can. Um, and all I'm simply going to do is basically place the peacock curl onto the hook and you can see how much, how far down the actual feather I've, I've come there. And I'm just making sure that I'm covering all the way to the actual CDC. And then I'm going to wind back up and stop. What's that about four mil, three mil from the actual eye of the hook. Um, because we've got a hackle to go in there. Um, I tend to, try and hand wind peacock curl um, again just because it is quite delicate I just find I get more control with my fingers and I'm just trying to avoid the hook point here as well uh, just going all the way up to the point where I'd finished off the actual tie and thread just secure the actual hurl, pinch and loop, and secure in. There we go. I'm just going to do that again, guys, because I just don't think I've come up far enough. It's a little bit hard with the camera in front of me. 
So I'm getting diffused in my fingers. Sorry, this is off probably fingers. That's all you're seeing. <laughs> there we go. That's better. So I've just come further up at this point. And then we'll secure off there. So uh, next bit is the hackle. And Tommy uses um, like a, a, a sort of a Greenwell's hen hackle. So it's just trying to get one because the hen capes are, you know, the feathers are short. So it's trying to get one that is not too long in fiber, but long enough in length to actually give you a couple of wraps. Um, so it can be a little bit of a hunt through the cape. But we'll see if we can get something suitable there we go okay so you can again just size the size of the barb of the actual feather up against it you, you'll see from your own tie and eye that it'll sit right or it's too long or whatever so hopefully that's that's okay so what i tend to do is tie in the feather by the tip Am I still on screen with that? Yes. And then I just simply cut off the top bit. So that I get a tying in triangle, I guess it is. And that just saves me having to trim. There we go. Just going to try and get rid of that. Sort that out in a minute. Okay, so again, um, I use small hackle pliers for this again, just because the hen fibers um, can be a little bit delicate. It's always good to practice your swearing though, sometimes when you fly tying. And what I'm trying to do, you can probably see I'm stroking with my thumb and my, my index finger. I'm stroking those fibers back so that they they already bend in the direction I'm hoping that they're I, I want them to sit. Um, and then I'll lock and anchor the first turn with my finger. And essentially, what I'm doing is bullying the hackle into the places that I want it to go. So we'll get a full wind all the way around. There we go, like so. Tie off. And Derek, I'm gonna to have to move my camera the next fly, I'm afraid. That's okay. Just give myself a bit more space. So tidy it up, lock it in. Don't worry about those fibers at the minute. We'll sort those out. And just cut off your stem. So next bit, a little bit of moisture on your index finger and your thumb. And just pinch those fibers down to the right and the left of the, the actual fly so that the CDC can come through. And you're just simply going to keep those in place with a little bit of thread wraps as well. Like so. Go. So you get that sort of the underbody of the legs, I guess. And then pulling the CDC forwards. Don't worry about the odd stray fiber. That's all. What you want to try and do. There we go. Just leave yourself. A bit of a, a, a plume at the end of the actual fly there as well. I put two wraps on, uh, on the actual CDC and then everything else goes underneath to try and prop, prop it up. There we go. And typically I'd, I'd sort of use brown thread for this, but I thought white might actually show up a little bit better for you. Um, and at this stage then it's a whip finish. 
underneath, which is going to be a little bit awkward again with this camera. So let's go half inch instead. Whoa, not there though. Right, I'll try that again. There we go. Okay. A little bit rough and ready around the edges there, guys, but you get the sort of the sense of the leather man. Um, it's debatable. I've tied this pattern and I've trimmed off the back end so that you get a clean look to the fly. But I've also tied it and left some of the strands like that because it might actually act as some form of sort of shock that the fish, you know, they see it as a struggling nymph or whatever in the surface. So it's entirely up to you and your, your own preference. Um, but that's Tommy Solberg's Leatherman. Okay. All right, there we go. Right. I'm going to have a go at moving the camera, Derek. Yeah. Anybody got any questions while, while uh, Neil's doing that? Tommy Solberg is Norwegian guy. Oh, is he? No, Just no a comment, way. Derek. I think they're very, very well tied. Oh, thank you very much, Thank. I feel like I'm all fingers and thumbs at the minute. It's, it's I think you're doing great. In front. I think you're doing great, Neil. Thank you, Malcolm. How's that looking, Derek? Is that That's still okay? okay? Slightly out of focus. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't seem to want to go back into focus, do they? No, it's out of focus. Uh, Paul, it was the Leatherman. It's called. Put your Just, finger. Put your finger on the it. fly. That's it. Bingo. Perfect. Perfect. Is that giving you big, big? Oh, I think that's okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Still happy, Derek? Yeah. 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 Great stuff. Okay. So no. that's a dry fly and a sort and of sort a, 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 a magnum nymph. Um, what I thought I'd have a go at would be something that we'd be possibly fish in March. Um, and this one's a bit of a, a sort of a hybrid between a dry fly um, and uh, a, a sort of a spider pattern, I guess. It's uh, a March Brown Jingler that I've, I've come up with that was quite successful for the trout in uh, early March, especially on the Welsh D. There's quite a good hatch of March Browns on the Welsh D. Um, so it's slightly bigger hook, this one. Um, it's, a, again, a dry fly uh, hook from Eric's Hooks. The, this one's the dry fly, dry fly light in a size 10. Um, so we're just going to start off with a little bit of round thread. Here we go. Hopefully this will work a bit better now. Okay, so uh, it'll tie and thread again. Um, for the tailing material, I'm just using a uh, cop de Leon. Um, just going to take maybe, uh, I don't know, five, six fibers. It, it, I know the, the March Browns obviously have um, three tails, um, but it doesn't really matter. This is more about balance in the fly in the water. So I've just ripped that off and I'm going to put in quite a longish sort of tail. And 
just again secure that on top with four or five wraps. There we go. Uh, next material is just thin gold wire, really. Just add a little bit of bling to the body. Uh, the body's going to be dubbed. So, again, this is just a little bit of a, a hopefully a sparkle that comes through the dubbing. Uh, so gold wire, um, number 26 gold wire from Vineyards. Um, so I'm just going to, oops, pop that under the thread wrap and pull it in and secure like so. And what I'm going, I'm trying to get the thread down more or less to the actual barb of the, the actual hook itself there as well. So dubbing wise, um, I'm using uh, the Vicuna dubbing and it's a particular blend mix that they do. It's the J JW blend. You can see all the sort of different colors there. Uh, for the March Brown, I'm going to go for sort of top corner. It's... Uh, I don't, I, unfortunately, the name of the blends has fallen off the back of this, but it's a, a sort of a fawn grey mix, um, which when dubbed on does does finish off quite well. Um, but again, to try and get a bit of profile to the actual body, I tend to bring the thread back up to where I'm going to start putting in the dry fly hackle, and I'll actually dub down and back up again, just to give myself a, a little bit more uh, Neil, it's it's Chris Flay, Neil. Hi, Chris. Hello, mate. That colour you're on about is JW uh, JWBWO. BWO, that's great. Thank you very much. All right, mate. Gold star for you, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, and what I'm doing, guys, is just putting a little bit of dubbing wax on the thread. It it just um helps the the, the dubbing noodle tape to the thread itself uh, and again the one thing I've, I've sort of learned over my, my time of tying is try not to put too much dubbing on in any one go um, because it'll just spin around itself and I tend to then just sort of spin and stretch and we'll get a nice sort of tight noodle hopefully move that on up put a little bit more on don't worry about putting too much on at all. You can always pull it off towards the end. You don't have to wrap it all. There we go. So that'll do us for now. We might need a bit more. So again, just... Oh, I'll tell you what, tying is so difficult. There we go, with a camera in front of you. So that's it. And every now and again, as you go down, just tighten your noodle up again as the sort of the ends of the fiber are gripping. It uh, just helps to spin the actual dubbing in. And I'm building up a base all the way to the bottom of the fly. And then we'll start building our profile here. As you can hopefully see, we do need a little bit more. But that's okay. So again, just pinch it on and then with your other hand, start the spinning in the same direction. There we go. We'll just finish off just giving the fly a little bit more of a carrot sort of shape profile. And we'll count the rib over the top like so. And secure the wire in, fold it back on itself. That's it. And then I just helicopter off. 
rather than rack my scissors. There we go. So that's the tail and the body of the jingler. Uh, next is the dry fly uh, apple, which I tend to go for quite a vivid sort of uh, red ginger, really. Um, and what I'm going to do with this is just sort of bend the hackle itself just to see what sort of barb length I'm going to get from that. And, you know, if, without being too fussy, that, that does look OK. Um, to try and get the hackles to sit properly, I'm actually going to strip one side of the hackles off. Um, so I'll leave the bottom fat fibers on and I'll strip these top ones off to make sure that I get a, a proper uh, collar of dry fly hackle at the front of the actual fly itself. So I'll not do that in front of the camera because I'll end up messing it up. So just forgive me for a minute, gents. I like take some hair off this hackle. So all I'm doing is stroking the fibers down and then pulling one side off just to give me a better chance of getting a, a hackle that will sit properly on the actual fly itself. There we go. And you can see, hopefully, oops, by stripping off the hackle on one side, you tend to get a slightly cleaner finish to it and a collar that will hopefully keep the actual fly quite high in the water as well. These sort of patterns, they're, they're great when they sit on the top. They're also great when they sort of get just semi-submerged as well. So I'm taking it just short of the eye of the hook. And I'm gonna just tie off here again. Oops. Oh, I thought I cut my thread there for a minute. Okay. A little bit rough and ready, guys. Sorry about that. With uh, Tying under pressure with an audience. Um, and again, you know, if you're fussy, you can trim off all these sort of end pieces and so on. Um, sometimes I'll use the quarterizer. Um, but again, just be very careful with that because the amount of times I've burnt through the thread um, at that stage of the fly. So I'm definitely not going to risk that one tonight with an audience. Um, last thing uh, for this particular pattern is just trying to get yourself a partridge feather that has a few brown sort of tints and so on to it. And again, it's just trying to gauge what sort of length of fiber do you want sitting at the front of your actual fly. Um, so I, I tend to do that just by sort of placing the stalk of the fly, uh, the feather, sorry, on the fly, just to see what that sort of length will be like. Uh, and I'm quite happy with that. So from this point of view, I'm just trying to see, there we go, is that better? There we go. Just grabbing the top of the, the feather and pulling down so that, I can then cut this bit into my tie-in point. So I end up with that sort of position there on the feather itself. Maybe a little long. Okay. 
sí, sí. <laughs> Strip off the top feathers. So that again, you're just wrapping around with a single side of the actual partridge feather itself. And I'm just going to try and tie in for the point. There we go. Sorry, Bill, it's me again. Uh, could you set uh, the fly a bit more into the camera? Say again, Alois. You break you're breaking up so much terrible. I think I'd knocked my, my camera um and moved it. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Um and again I tend to just go with finger thumb. And secure this because I do find that these partridge hackle stems are very, very delicate. There we go. There we go. So what, what you're trying to finish off with is a front tackle that doesn't sweep back. It, it's that sort of spider-like finish that you're looking for with the with this pattern. Um, so the, the part ridge is, is there for, you know, a, a sort of leggy, struggling nymph sort of look to this, this uh, fly itself. And then I'll just try and tidy up the head of the fly a little bit. There we go. That's it. The cracking pat and the jingler. It is. It is. Represents uh, something and nothing, really. You know, with the mayfly, you can do mayfly jinglers as well, which is uh, another good river pattern. Um, and then just to make sure that the partridge hackle, you know, I've spent a lot of my money on this particular fly tying tool. Um, I find that. <laughs> The the toothbrush is a great um just gentle way of, of getting those hackle fibers to sit the way you want them to. Um yeah, the head of the fly is a little bit messy there, but you, you get the gist, guys. Um so that, that would be a March Brown jingler that um quite often I would sort of use at the uh the start of uh, the season, March when the March Browns appear. Um but interestingly enough, I've I've have on other patterns of it, I've trimmed off the underside um of the first hackle, the dry fly hackle. Um, but I don't feel that the actual fly itself fishes as well. Um it does tend to fish a lot more like a wet fly in that sense, especially on the river. Um so I, I tend to leave the underside of the hackle in there just to to get that sort of angled, elevated look, uh, aspect to the fly. But there you go, that's the March Brown. Any questions, guys? Are we all happy? All happy, Derek? Yeah, yeah, we're all good. All good. Right, let's just have another go at readjusting this camera because it's slipping down the actual uh, post here on me. Let's see, is that, is that still in focus? Yeah. Right, that might get us a better chance of doing something here. There we go. Perfect. How's that? Perfect. Good stuff. Good stuff, right. That's as tight as I can get it. Right. There we go. Okay.
So, what time are we on? Ten to eight. We still okay, Derek, for time? Yeah, we got in unlimited time, Neil, so don't worry. Brill. No problem. Uh, what do I plan to do next? So, um, let's, let's have a go at one of my favourite river nymphs. And this one involves a little bit of colouring in, so who doesn't like a little bit of colouring in, eh? <laughs> so just let me get my stuff in order here to the side. So if you need to go and get grab a cup of tea or have a drink or whatever, guys, go for it. I'll just spend two or three minutes putting my stuff together here for this one. Nice to see so many on tonight. Good turnout. Please don't tell me how many are online, Derek, otherwise I'll fall to pieces here. Start panicking, yeah, I don't know. No. Even <laughs> Willie's joined us, haven't you, Willie? Yeah. Managed to get back to town again after the Christmas break, so I thought I'm just sitting here twiddling my fingers. <laughs> so I'll open up here and sit back and enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see Ken as well. Yes, first time I've been on with you. Thanks for the invite. Seems like you've got quite a few followers. In the low hundreds today, isn't it? Oh, behave yourself. I thought it was <laughs> just over 210. <laughs> It's a screen full anyway. <laughs> Do we get autographs later? Uh, only if you pay cash. I signed something for you before. I know about you and cash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, makes it will go round. Stuart, is that is that you? I can I can see. Uh... Two la two lads there with a, an A, but it doesn't say who it is. It is... Yeah, is yeah. it us? Is that you, Stuart? No, it's Richard. <laughs> ah, and I've got Tom with me tonight, who's not a member. That's okay. So he might join. The the more the merrier. I'm not sure he'll join after seeing my attempt at this, Derek. Yeah, he will. <laughs> no, it's great. Click on me. <laughs> right then, um, I'm going to have a go at um, the Craigie Killers variant uh, that I, I tend to use uh, a lot on the river. It's a great, great grayling and trout pattern. Um, the original, the, the gray, uh, Craigie's Killer is originally tied with a a, a jig body, a complete tungsten jig body, um, and it, the Craig, uh, Craig McDonald's the, the the sort of designer, the original designer of the fly, um, the Scottish guy, and I think he fishes the Clyde quite a lot, um, for winter grayling. So he he definitely designed a fly that was eye catching, um, and sort of a depth bomb t effect to it. I wanted something that was a little bit more um, nymph like, uh, with less weight so the bead on this one's a three and a half mil uh tungsten bead um so we're going to secure that in place in a minute uh the body um is made up with again the virtual nymph skin and then i've sort of jazzed it up a little bit with a, a few details um to to do with the, the sort of nymph attraction really um so fingers crossed i can get this one done with the camera in front of me but sure We'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. So the first thing I tend to do, uh, maybe not necessary, but I do tend to bulk up just the front of the actual uh, hook with about four, maybe five layers um, of uh, tie and thread just to give the actual bead itself something to sit on on top of the super glue. Um, so 
at this point. Uh, just chuck in the whip finish tool. Oh, bugger, I've moved the camera. What's the name again, please, Neil? Um, it's the original is Craigie's Killer. And this is just the Craigie's Killer variant um, that I've done. Um, there's there's pictures of this, Derek, on my Instagram feed. Yeah. Um, or I did a YouTube video on this one as well um, for the Eric's uh, Hooks guys. So if you go to their YouTube site, um, it'll be on there as well. So again, that'll just hopefully help the actual uh, bead itself sit in and stay in place. A, when we're tying, because um, there's nothing worse with the bead sort of wandering down the hook as you're doing a bit of tying. But more so, um, what I did find is, and this super glue's obviously gone off a little bit. <laughs> um, what I did find is if the super, uh, the bead moves, it tends to cut and bite into the fez, uh, the peacock curl, that's the last part of this fly. Um, and can nip it and destroy it really before the, the flies outfished itself. Um, so hopefully that's now going to dry in and secure itself. So what I'm going to do is just put a little bit of a thread down behind that just to make sure we get it to sit still. There we go. Hopefully that will behave itself a bit better now. Okay, so I'm going to try and work all the way down the hook to the just taking in a bit of the bend. I want to have that sort of crippled look and effect to the actual fly. Um, so I'm going to more or less try and gauge my fly to, to sort of st stop off round about this point here. Um, the original Craigie's uh, doesn't have any uh, tail fibres, but again, I tend to, to pop uh, a CD uh, cock to lay on fibers in um just to give it again a bit more of a nymphy sort of appeal so that's the first thing that we're going to tie in place here so i'm just trying to get some off there we go so what i'm trying to imagine is the tail length as i finish the fly body so in my mind i'm working to round about where my fingernail is now on the hook so i'm going to try and gauge the actual tail fibers to that point and pinch and loop there and work my way down to that point so we'll, we'll go around the bend a little bit more than that obviously as we finish off tying in a few more of the materials so the actual decoration if you like the nymph decoration is a section of brown tying thread and I'm going to put tying thread on both sides there we go. of the actual nymph itself and I'll, I'll explain what that's for. Oops, sorry. As we get to that point. So work my way back up because we've got a few more materials to go in. Um, so the brown tie thread is going to act as a, a sort of a lateral line. Um, so what I do need to have is a way of securing that lateral line once the body's been put in place. Um, and I tend to use the nylon that I used on the actual um, first maggot pattern is, again, what I'm going to put in now, but that's what I'm going to use to secure the brown thread when we get to that stage. So again, to set that three or four wraps, slippy stuff, and then I'll just secure that out of the way on my vise for later on. Okay, last thing is the virtual nymph skin, which again, we're gonna cut into a point to make sure that we tie in 
There we go. Tie it in nice and neat to trap it and then stretch. I'll put my hand underneath the camera, it'll be easier. There we go. I'm just trapping that corner, slight pull, a couple of wraps, and then I can go for it. And what I'm trying to do is keep an eye on where I'm going with the end of the nymph body, but at the same time, making sure that the tail isn't wrapping itself around the actual hook as well. So that looks fairly decent there. Okay. So I think that'll do us. So I'm going to go back up with the actual tie and thread. Just put off the end fibers. Okay, so I could build up the profile using um, the actual thread, but it does take up an awful lot of thread. So what I tend to do now is I'll take this off, secure it, take it off for a minute. Like so, and I'm gonna use a different material. And it's this stuff, the uni stretch uh white uni stretch white and i tend to use it as a, a profile builder um hopefully you'll see in a minute how quickly it, it actually does that job just pop it back into the actual bobbin holder quick way of building up bulk yeah very quick way without going through all your tying thread so uh, it's great this stuff's fantastic for um buzzer breathers as well that sort of thing. Um, but again, I I tend to tie it in at the start, just behind the bead. And we'll just use it to build up a little bit of a bulky body very quickly. So don't take it all the way down um, to the end of the fly, because I want the end, the, the, the end of the abdomen to be quite uh, small, skinny, and we we'll just build up a bit of a profile. And we're done. So you can see how quick that is. The nymph skin will allow you to build on top of that, obviously, as well. So at this point, I'm going to put the tan thread back on, which I didn't do when I was doing this one for the YouTube video for the Eric's Hooks guys. And I got the nymph skin perfectly on up to the point where I went to tie it off and I realized I had nothing to tie it off with. So you can uh, maybe see that mistake on YouTube still. So again, trying to get that tie-in point. Uh, my... The tie-in point of the actual uh, sorry, the cut point of the nymph skin is pointing upwards. So that rough cut will disappear as I wrap upwards. Quite a lot of tension to start with. And then we start to slowly and gradually release the tension. And what I'm trying to do is cover half of the wrap previous to the one I've just done. And like so. Okay. If you're not happy with the actual profile, you can take it off. No problem. Just unwind. Just even let it go because essentially this stuff's just elastic band. Um, and you can go all the way back to replace and go again if you if you really are not happy with your, your first effort. So if you haven't tied with virtual nymph skin, I would highly recommend it especially for the uh the nymphs it's fantastic stuff there we go okay and again slippy stuff so i'm just trying to get two or three decent wraps on top of the nymph skin and then two or three underneath to give the thread something to grip to, and then go again on top of the nymph skin. 
like so. That allows you to have confidence to really yank on the, the actual nymph skin, stretch it out to its end point, full tension, clip away, and then it's sort of a, it's a very clean cut that you get, and that's nicely secure. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is secure the thread and get rid of it. temporarily because we're going to try and put some nymph detail in here. I'm hoping I can do this with the camera in front of me. We'll see. So what I'm going to now do is use the two pieces of brown thread that I've got as my lateral line that runs up the body of the actual fly. So hopefully when we secure it, it'll sit along the edge of the, the middle of the abdomen. And I'm going to use that nylon to do that. So just double check. And can you guys, is that still in focus? Because I will need to move the vice a little bit. Is that okay, Derek? It comes in and out. All right, okay. So what I'm doing here is I've got the nylon to the left the thread is above the nylon and i'm just going around once letting go and i'll do a rotation and i need to then grab the next part of the brown thread and i go up into the next segment of the fly like so And it's just a matter of keeping the tension in your right hand or the, the bobbin hand if, if you're left-handed. Um, following the lines of the nymph skin, and it's easier to do that if you rotate the vise and just place that thread halfway along the body if you can. I know it's a bit fiddly and you might be thinking, why on earth but this serves two purposes it settles my fly tires ocd um and you know i just i, I like sort of adding to, to patterns if i can but also you'll see when we put the resin on it actually acts as a a little bit of a barrier for the resin and stops the resin running right underneath as well so there is a small function to this um, and hopefully the camera is starting to pick this up is it can you... not sure you can see that too well you'll see it when you put the resin on yeah Maybe should have done the lateral line in black. It's showing up better. There we go. And the other added bonus of doing this as well is you can see that the nylon is digging into the nymph skin when we're getting a lovely sort of segmentation on the body, which the original fly, because it's tied on a complete jig body, um, the original fly doesn't have that sort of level of um, segmentation. Last one. There we go. Okay. So a little bit bumpy with the actual lateral line there, but it's not too bad. So I just you can use the nylon to secure that thread. Trim off. And because the nylon is quite thin, I should be able to just put a two turn whip finish in. Just to secure that like so. All right then, now the best bit. We'll get the color in.
There we go. So what I'm going to do first of all is just put a little bit of a hot spot and I'll use orange resin for this one. So again, when I'm doing the hot spots, I tend to try and just use a, a dubbing needle because again, it just gives me a little bit more control. Um, if any of you use the resins, you'll probably have realized by now they've got a, a sell by date or a use by date. So this one, I don't know if you can see that, but it is pretty thick. So it, that can make it awkward to actually put onto the actual fly itself. So a little trick is just mix it with some clear Thin Man or clear classic um, resin and you'll find hopefully that it'll become a little bit more manageable rather than having to fork out another 16 quid or so on a, a new bottle because the stuff's not cheap. So I'm just mixing myself a little bit more orange hot spot and thinning that stuff out with a little bit more Thin Man. One tip, Neil. Yeah. If you keep your resin in the fridge, it lasts a lot longer. What do I do with my beer, though? Well, you just don't have to have one gas can. Drink one. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't realise that. Yeah, most of them, that they last a lot longer if they're kept in the fridge. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, hopefully, I don't know if you can see that, that... Mixing it with the Thin Man has made a little bit of a difference. So what I'm trying to do is then just put a little bit of a hot spot in underneath. And you can see it is quite thick still, this. But there we do. That'll do it nicely. Um, and again, that's settling itself nicely in there. So I'm just going to zap it with the UV torch. Like so. Again, if I turn the house lights down, you can see that this hopefully will add a beautiful little sort of hot spot hit to the fly itself. So next bit, colouring in. So what I tend to do is start with the lighter colours first, and I'll just go in underneath the thread line that I've got and put in a little bit of a line of yellow in there. And the same on this side as well. There, like so. And then right along the back of the fly, going up against the ridges, I, I'd always bring the pen upwards because then you get a darker sort of, you get more ink sitting inside the segments and therefore it becomes a little bit more distinct that way. Just make sure I've gone, yeah, I've gone right to the edges of the lateral line that I've put in, like so. Perfect. A um, little bit of dab of orange, uh, sorry, brown at the very end, just as an indicator of a bit of a thorax start, maybe. I'm sure the fish wouldn't really care. And what I'm going to do is use... Um, Gulf Dirty Motor Oil. Um, it's one of the, the my favourites for the, the sort of the nymph style um, resin bugs. And again, I'm just going to put a blob of that on the dubbing needle and start at the thickest part of the fly. And just take my time and work it round because this resin is going to form a shell that hopefully has a, a nice curve to it that follows the, the line of the actual uh, hook itself as well. So a bit more resin. And this is where that thread line comes into its own because it stops me going over with the resin. Okay. And the same on this side. Let's bring it down a little bit further. But hopefully you can see that there's a, a quite a curve back to that now, um, which I'm quite happy about. So 
if I just keep that moving so the profile of it doesn't disappear before I can zap it with this. So although that was quite a vivid green color that I put in underneath because of the dirty motor oil, um, it, it actually does bring it to a very nice sort of nymph shell. But again, Sharpie pens, some of them tend to be UV, so it's it's very good um, for them from that point of view as well. And the last thing to do with this one is to stick our peacock curl finish on the front. So it's back on with the, the tie and thread. Um, there we go. So you can see that lateral line now. Has it showed up, Derek, has it? Yeah. Brilliant. So again, I'm just making sure I've got pretty much a, a solid area to, to actually put the peacock curl onto. Right, we'll go. Um, and what I tend to do for this one is I'll go with two peacock curls just to make sure that we get a good finish to the actual fly itself. There we go. Ah, I've just broken one, but it doesn't matter. Never mind. We'll go with one for for now, guys. Normally, two would be my chosen amount for it, but ah, this one's covering it up all right, actually. Again, those peacock curls are taken really close to the eye of the actual feather. Um, I just find them a little bit more ir iridescent, really. Fill that gap nicely. It has, hasn't it? It's nearly like I've tied it before, Derek. There we go. As I say, this is my good. You probably find this on my Euro rig all year. Um, it's a cracking little nymph. It really is. Um, you know, the, if you look at the original, I've used the color scheme and I've added the peacock curl. I've added the thread. Um. But this, this sort of the colouring um, is very similar to, to what Craig had put on his original. Um, so all I'm going to do, uh, again, just to slightly cover up the white thread, a little bit of Sharpie pen. And I'll awkwardly do a whip finish for you in front of the camera. There we go. No, of course it hasn't itself hasn't it Aye. now we'll start again on that one cool. nice rescue <laughs> I've definitely done that before, Derek, as well. We all have. There we go. Right. We'll go for take two. See if I can fit this in this time. There we go. That might go for a bit better. There we go. Okay. So I'm not going to do it tonight, but what? Actually, I will. I'll show you. What I tend to do, because you've got the peacock curl there, if you go in with the varnish um, on the end of a needle, it can go, end up going everywhere. So a little trick is just to dab a bit on your actual tie and thread. Like so. And then just put a bit of a whip finish in there. And that will soak nicely into the thread below. And it also keeps your hurl, hopefully, as, as sort of varnish free as you can make it. Um, set your, your peacock hurl with your expensive toothbrush tool and job's a good one.
Yeah. Craigie's Craigie's killer variant. Nice fly that. Yeah, it's a great one. The the trout grayling, they love it. Absolutely love it. Um and you know if it's got trigger points, a little bit of a nymphy look to it. Um, you know, shows up really nicely. So there you go, gentlemen, and uh, everybody that's in the, the actual feed. I haven't seen any names. I, I desperately didn't want to see how many people were watching or listening or tuning in. So I really appreciate you giving me the chance to do this. So I've actually quite enjoyed it. Neil, thank you very much. Fantastic stuff, mate. No, thank you, Pete. Thank you. No, I loved it. Loved it. Thanks, Neil. You, you, you had 34, Neil. Neil. Very good. 34 people. Wow. Wow. Okay. 134. <laughs> Thank you, no, Nick. That was very interesting. No, very no. Good. Thank you very much. I, I did really enjoy that. And um, I think if I, if I can get my head around a better camera setup, I'd be happy to come along and do a few more for you at some point. You're a very tiny tire. Thanks. Thank you. Usually a lot tidier, um, but yeah, it, it's amazing how awkward time with a camera in front of you actually is. Yeah. yeah. No, lovely stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Cheers. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Come on. Bye. 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 Bye.